So far, we have been finding Taylor polynomials and Maclaurin polynomials. Today, we're going to focus on series, um, and so we're going to be writing general terms for series. This is not a hard, um, a hard thing to do. I usually combine this with our very next lesson on, and do it on the same day, which um, we're going to do here in the same video. So I'm going to be also determining the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence. So let's dive in, do some problems, do some examples. We're going to find a Taylor series for this function centered at x equals 2. We're going to give the first four non-zero terms and the general term. Okay. So the first thing I will do is find the series. So since we're centered at 2 and our argument is 5x, as x goes to 2, 5x does not go to 0. So I cannot use our memorized Maclaurin for e to the x. I have to go through the derivative process. So I start with f of x and then find f of c, so f of 2 f of 2 here would be e to the 10th. And now find the derivative, the first derivative. The derivative of e to the 5x is 5e to the 5x. So f prime at 2 would be 5e to the 10. The second derivative would be 5 squared e to the 5x. So at 2, that would be 5 squared e to the 10. And yes, you could put 25 there if you wanted to. Not a problem. Since we're going to be writing the general term, I tend not to simplify things. Okay? If you simplify things too much, you might lose your pattern and be stuck with something that you've forgotten how, how to, to write the general term for. So I tend not to simplify when, I'm, when I have to write a general term. The third derivative here would be 5 to the third e to the 5x. And so the third derivative at 2 would be 5 to the third e to the 10. And I see the pattern, so I'm going to stop. Okay. The very first term would be, the very first term would just be the constant term, so e to the 10. The second term this is the derivative, and it's only the derivative, so that's not all there is to this coefficient. It's 5e e to the 10 times x minus 2 to the first power divided by 1 factorial. Okay. The next term would be 5 squared e to the 10 times x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. And then 5 to the third e to the 10, x minus 2 cubed over 3 factorial, and this would go on, okay? And now I'm going to write that, the, here are the first four non-zero terms, yeah? There's four terms there, and none of them are zero, so those are the first four non-zero terms. Now I'm going to write the general term. And I usually write the general term just right here, okay? So here's where we're looking for the pattern. What is the pattern? Well, the first thing that I see is that I know that there's an e to the 10 in every term. I usually go to like one of my middle terms and I focus on one of my middle terms. What's the pattern here? Well, the first thing I see though in the term, the first thing I see is the five. And here I went from 5 to the first, 5 squared, 5 cubed. If I wanted to, I could make that a 5 to the 0. So the first thing I'm going to write here is 5 to the n. n is starting at 0. So 5 to the 0, it satisfies even that first term. Then I'm going to write e to the 10. And it's just e to the 10. There are no n's because this is always just e to the 10. And then I see all the x minus 2's. So x minus 2 to the what power? Well, this was a power of 1. This was a power of 2, like that is. That's a power of 3, like that is. So this is still just n. 
And again, if the power was 0, that would be 1, and so it satisfies even that very first term. All divided by, now here's our factorials. n factorial will satisfy all of the factorials, even the 0 factorial in the first term. Plus, I'm squeezing it in, dot, dot, dot. I should have started a little bit further to the left or written a little bit smaller. Plus dot, dot, dot. So here are our first four non-zeros. And here is our general term. Okay, let's do another one. Let's write the Maclaurin series for cosine x. That's our memorized. That's Maclaurin cosine, that, that's our memorized. So we're going to get the first four non-zero terms and the general term. Cosine x starts with 1 and then alternates, alternates in sign, so minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus, and then it goes on and on. There are the first four non-zero terms. Now here comes the general term. I put another plus, put another plus there, and then here will be your general term. First of all, the series is alternating in sign. So I'm going to take care of what makes the series alternate in sign. It's going to be negative 1 to the n or the n plus 1. If I'm starting n at 0, which I like to do, my first term is positive. Negative 1 to the 0 is a positive 1, so that satisfies the very first term's sign. Therefore, I know it's going to satisfy every other sign x to the, okay, everything has an x to a power, right? Now, this power, these powers are differing by 2. Since they are differing by 2, I know I must have a 2n here. If they're differing by 2, you're going to have to have a 2n. Sometimes then you have to add or subtract something to get the power of your very first term. Well, the power of my first term is 0, because we don't have an x here, so it's x to the 0. Since I'm starting in at 0, my first term will be satisfied, and we are at 0. For the second term, n is 1, so I'll have 2 there. For the third term, n is 2, so I'll have a 4 there, and so everything is satisfied. The factorial is the same as that exponent, 2n factorial. Do not just put 2n and then a factorial after the n. You have to put parentheses around the 2n. Otherwise, it's just 2 times n factorial. It is not the factorial of 2n, which is what we want. End it with another plus dot 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 to show that your series goes on forever. This is exactly how you need to write this. Okay, First four non-zeros, general term but don't forget your plus dot dot dots, okay? Next step, we're going to write the Maclaurin for sine x, our other memorized one. Well, sine starts at x, alternates in sine, has all the odds, okay? Plus, so there are our first four non-zeros. Now the general. We're alternating in sign beginning at positive. So negative 1 to the n will start us off positive. My n is starting at 0. You do not have to say what n is starting at, by the way. Now we're going to go to our x's. Well, these x's are also differing by 2, right? You're adding 2 each time. So I know I must have a 2n. If they were differing by 3, I would have a 3n. If they were differing by 4, I'd have a 4n. Okay, but this time, our first one needs to be a 1. I'm starting in at 0. To get that first one to be a 1, I must add 1 to that. Divided by, the denominator is the factorial of each exponent, so 2n plus 1 factorial. Finish it up. Okay, let's write the Maclaurin series for this one. 
and we're going to give the first four non-zeros and the general term. It's the Maclaurin series, and I see a little cosine x in there, so I'm going to start with that, okay? I'm actually going to think of this as, instead of dividing the whole thing by 2, I'm going to think of it as taking one half of the whole thing. Okay? So this is going to be one half times x, yeah, times, and here's going to be my series for cosine x. So I'm going to make this approximately equal to, because later today we'll find that that's actually an equal to, but right now we don't know that yet, so I'm just going to put approximately equal to. So here's going to be my series for cosine x which starts with 1 and then alternates in sign and hits all of our evens. I'm closing my parentheses on my cosine x and then I'm going to add 1 and then I should have put some big brackets here. I'm closing that off. Okay. Now, I know I haven't gotten the general term, but I am nowhere near ready for my general term yet. So I'm just going to keep going. So this is going to be 1 half times, okay, x times, I'm going to distribute my x's. x times 1 is x. x times x squared over 2 factorial is x cubed over 2 factorial plus x to the fifth over 4 factorial minus x to the 7 over 6 factorial plus dot 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 plus 1. Okay. Now, that little plus 1 that's sticking out there, we usually, since it has no x's with it, I'm going to slide that and put it in the front. Okay. So I'll have 1 plus x instead of back here in the back. So now I'm going to distribute the 1 half. 1 half times 1 is 1 half, plus 1 half times x is x over 2, minus 1 half times this thing will be x cubed time over 2 times 2 factorial, plus x to the fifth over 2 times 4 factorial, minus x to the 7th over 2 times 6 factorial plus I could get the pattern here I know what it is so plus dot 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 okay there's it's as cleaned up as it's going to get and now I'm going to write my general term so for the general term first of all know this your general term um, does not necessarily have to satisfy every term for instance, lots of times our constant term will not be satisfied by our general term. Our general term is just repeating the pattern that's formed back here. It doesn't necessarily have to satisfy that first term. In this case it will, but it doesn't have to. Okay? So, I see first of all, well, actually it won't be satisfied because of the first term I'm not going to worry about the sign back here, but I do need to worry about the signs here. So I'm going to say that this is going to be negative 1 to the, I'm going to start my pattern with this term where that it is positive, okay? So it is positive, so I'm going to have a zero, an, an n there because that first term is going to be when n is 0, okay? I'm ignoring the, the 1 half for right now. Okay, times, now here comes my x's, x to the, I don't know why I put parentheses there, don't need them, but I did, so whatever. Okay, the powers are differing by 2, so 2n, I want my first power to be a 1, so I need to add 1, divided by, everything has a 2, 2 times, now I want some factorials, but these factorials are not the same as our power this time. They're one less than it, so it's back to the 2n times 2n factorial plus dot dot dot. 
Okay, this almost satisfied our first term, but our first term would be then when n was a negative 1, and mm, no, it wouldn't satisfy it at all. So our first term is not satisfied, but that's okay. This, this is the pattern for all of these terms, and so that is the general term. So your general term does not necessarily have to satisfy the very first term or even the first two terms sometimes, okay? All righty, is that it for that? Yes, that's it for that. Okay, let's now shift gears and we're going to talk about the intervals of convergence, radius of convergence and interval of convergence. Okay, so the drawback back to using a Taylor series to approximate a function is that sometimes the series are only accurate near the value x equals c. Okay, just like um, when we first were taking a look at sine x and we saw how it, the, the polynomial lined up for part of it but not all of it. Um, similar to that, okay, we want to know what values of x make the series equal the function. That's going to be the interval of convergence. It's going to give us the x values that make the series equal the function. Okay, that's our interval of convergence. These are worth big points on the on FRQs. We'll be sure to um, to do these to learn these and do these well. Okay, to find the values of x to make the series converge, we are, will find the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence using the ratio test going to be using the ratio test. Okay, so first of all, at what value of x is this series centered? We are centered at 5. Okay, so we will remember that as we go on. We'll keep that in mind, all right? Okay, so let's set up the ratio test here. The limit as n goes to infinity of Okay, I am looking over here at our series. And I know I start with the n plus 1 term. Since I have absolute values, I can ignore the negative 1 and just go straight to the other things. Okay, I start with the n plus 1 term, so I am replacing every n with n plus 1. I'm going to have x minus 5 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 times 2 to the n plus 1. Start with that. And then we multiply by the reciprocal of the nth term. So n times 2 to the n divided by x minus 5 to the n. Okay. I'm going to clean up this ratio. Okay. I'm looking. So I have here, let me get some colors out. I see that I have this x minus 5 to the n plus 1, and over here I have x minus 5 to the n. How do those two reduce? Well, since this power is always 1 larger than this power, they reduce leaving one of these x minus 5's on top. Okay. Now let's look at, let me get a different color, let's look at the 2's. Down here I have 2 to the n plus 1. Here I have 2 to the n. How do those reduce? Well, this exponent always is always 1 larger than this exponent. So these will reduce, leaving a single 2 in the denominator. And now let's consider these um, running out of colors here. Let's consider the n's. n and n plus 1 do not reduce. They do not reduce. I just write them. The limit is going to take care of those. As n goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, the plus 1 won't matter. It's insignificant. I'm left with n over n. This whole thing will go to 1 as n goes to infinity. So this limit is the absolute value of x minus 5 
divided by the absolute value of 2, which is 2, and that is the limit. Now back when we did ratio test, we determined when we got the limit, we compared it against 1. Is it bigger than 1? Is it less than 1? If it's less than 1, that series converges. And we are looking for the interval of convergence. So we want the values of x that make this series converge. So we want this to be less than 1 for convergence. That means that I can multiply both sides by 2. So that means that the absolute value of x minus 5 is less than 2, which means that x minus 5 is between negative 2 and 2, which means that x is between 7 and 3. So x is between 7 and 3, 3 and 7. This is what we call the interior of the interval of convergence. It's only the interior of the interval of convergence, though. Why is it not the interval of convergence? Because this certainly looks like an interval. It's not exactly the interval. It might be exactly, but we don't know that yet because the ratio test is inconclusive when the limit is equal to 1. It's inconclusive. We can't use it if it's equal to 1. So, in short, we may or may not be needing to include these two boundaries because when x is 3, when x is 3, we get 1. When x is 7, we get 1. And if the ratio test is equal, if the limit is equal to 1, we don't know if it converges or not. We may converge. So we need to examine those two boundaries. So when or at x is equal to 3. When x is equal to 3, what do we have? I'm going to go back to my original series, including, we have to now include that negative 1 again. When x is negative 3, our series is negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 3 minus 5 to the n divided by n times 2 to the n. I need to see if this converges or not. That is equal to the series negative, um, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times negative 2 to the n divided by n times 2 to the n, which is equal to negative 1 to the n plus 1. I have negative 2 to the n, which means negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n. That's what that means. Divided by n times 2 to the n. Well, the 2 to the n's reduce out. And now I have the series. I'm going to combine my negative 1's by, multiply, by adding my exponents. Add your exponents, and I have 2n plus 1 over n, okay? 2n, 2n means our signs are always going to be the same. They are always going to be the same. If it was a single n plus 1 or plus 2 or plus 3, single n, any odd power and odd coefficient of n, that makes it alternate. But with the, any even coefficient of n, we will not alternate. We will not alternate. So this is the same as, um, since we have the plus 1, this will always be negative. No matter what you put in for n, this is always negative. Negative 1 over n which is negative, I'm going to take out the negative, negative sum of 1 over n. I do that because this is our harmonic series, and the harmonic series diverges. So this is, um, I would say this diverges, uh, diverges, and then I would say why, very brief, briefly say why. It's the harmonic series. 
Or if you prefer, you could say, you could leave it as this and say this is a P series with P equal to 1, so it diverges. You could say that instead of the diverging harmonic series. Okay? The whole point is when X is 3, our series diverges. So we are not going to include 3 in our interval. Now we're going to go check 7. So when X is 7, when X is 7, our series, I'm putting 7 in for X, our series is going to be negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 7 minus 5 to the n over n times 2 to the n. This is going to be negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n. There I go with my parentheses again. I didn't need those, but there you go. Over n times 2 to the n, and these 2 to the n's will reduce out. And we're left with negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n. And this is the alternating harmonic series. And the alternating harmonic series does converge, right? So I can say this is the converging alternating harmonic, alternating harmonic series. Or if you prefer, you could say alternates in sign, decreases in magnitude, to zero, therefore converges. Either way is fine, but you do need to say why. So our interval of convergence is three to seven, but including the seven. Okay? So always end with your answer. Do not go and adjust this thing that you wrote up here. Because if you adjust this that you wrote up here, you're, it, it now no longer is a result of what you had in front of it. Okay? So re rewrite your final answer right here. Or write your final answer right there. Alrighty. Another example. Let us determine the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence for this one. Okay, so we're going to use the ratio test. Setting up the ratio test, I can ignore the negative one, go straight to this. I'm going to replace n with n plus 1. So this is going to be x minus 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1, so n plus 2 divided by 2 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 squared times the reciprocal of our nth term 2 to the n times n squared over x minus 3 to the n plus 1 which is, I'm going to clean this up, okay Looking at our x minus 3's, this exponent is always one larger than this exponent. So we're left with an x minus 3 up on top. Now let's take a look at our 2's. Here's 2 to the n plus 1, here's 2 to the n. This exponent is always one larger than this exponent, so we'll be left with a 2 in the bottom. The n squared and the n plus 1 squared. Do not reduce. We just rewrite them and the limit will take care of them. Okay. You agree that this would have an n squared in it as its highest degree term. No other term would be significant as n goes to infinity. So this is still going to 1. And we're going to be left with the absolute value of x minus 3 divided by 2. Okay. And to make this converge, we force this to be less than 1.
which means that the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than 2. And I just realized something in that previous problem. I never specifically wrote what the radius of convergence was. The radius of convergence is, so we're centered at 5. Think of it this way. We're centered at 5, and we went from 3 to 7. So what's the radius? Oops, can't see that. So what's the radius? Here's the convergence, right, including the 7, not including the 3, but there's the convergence. What is the radius of the convergence? Well, the radius of convergence is 2. Okay, so that would be 2 there. You can always see the radius of convergence way back after you find your limit. After you find your limit right here in this step, I know that the radius is 2 because of that. Okay, so that's why it reminded me of it at this point because the radius of convergence is still 2 on this one as well. So x minus 3 is between negative 2 and 2. So x is between, I'm going to add 3 to all three parts, so 5 and 1. x is between five, 1 and 5. Time to, this, this is the interior of the interval of convergence. And now I'm going to come and check our boundaries. So when x is 1, our series will be negative 1 to the n minus 1 times 1 minus 3 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n, n squared. Okay, clean this up. Negative 1 to the n minus 1, negative 2 to the n plus 1, over 2 to the n, times n squared. Okay, negative 1 to the n minus 1, times negative 1 to the n plus 1, times 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n times n squared. Okay, I'm going to combine my negative 1's by adding their two powers. So we'll have 2n plus nothing times, and now I'm going to reduce these. I have 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n this power is one higher than that power, so I am left with a 2 on top divided by n squared. Okay, My power here on the negative 1 is, has an even number in front of the n, so this will always be even. Negative 1 to any even number is positive. So this is 2 over n squared. That is a p-series. P is 2, which is greater than 1, therefore we converge. Okay? So I know I'm going to be including 1 in my interval. Now we're going to check x is equal to 5, the other boundary. Alrighty, so I'm going back to my original series, putting 5 in for x. Okay, so we'll have negative 1 to the n minus 1, 2 to the n plus 1, over 2 to the n times n squared. The 2's reduced, leaving a 2 up on top. Okay, and this one is alternating. It is alternating in sign. It is alternating in sign. And the terms decrease in magnitude to zero. Therefore, it converges as well. So the interval of convergence is one 
to 5, including both the 1 and the 5. The radius of convergence is 2. We found that out back there. Alrighty, looking at the time. How am I doing on time? This is going to be one of those days in class where I talk quickly. Okay, number three. Same thing here. Um, however, they already, okay, so let's see. Here we just want to find the value of r. So we're only looking for the radius of convergence here. So we're not going to have to check the boundaries on this one. So let's see, we're still going to go through the ratio test. I'm going to ignore my negative 1. I have x minus 5 and I'm replacing n with n plus 1. That is not 2n plus 1 here, you guys. That's 2 times n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 over n um, times n over, goodness, x minus 5 to the 2n. Okay, we are going to clean this up. All right, that is x minus 5 to the 2n plus 2 divided by x minus 5 to the 2n times n over n plus 1. Yeah? Taking one extra step this time because of that 2 times n plus 1. All right, this exponent is always 2 larger than the bottom exponent. So that's going to be x minus 5 squared. Yeah? Now we're going to take the limit. As n goes to infinity, this thing goes to 1. And this is equal to the absolute value of x minus 5 squared. And that's what we want to have less than 1. Okay, how do you take care of that squared? How do you take care of that squared? Well, you square root both sides. Square root both sides and you get the absolute value of x minus 5 is less than still 1. Okay, but if that was a 2 or 3 or 5 or anything else, you would square root and it would be reflected right there. So the value of r here, the value of r is 1. Okay, what about this one? Number four, multiple choice. I made this a multiple choice because I see something here. I see a factorial in the bottom. A factorial in the bottom means that this thing is going to converge for all values of x. It does not matter what x is, this thing will converge. D. Uh, number five. Okay, what is the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence? And I see big mama. And there is no denominator, that means she's on top. Well, if Big Mom is on top, usually that means we diverge, yeah? And we are going to diverge, except, except for one single value of x that will make this thing converge. And that is when we are exactly at the center. When you are exactly at the center, I'm going to write that down, except x equals the center. When you are exactly at the center, you always converge. It is always right there. So this is equal to 3. So um, the correct answer here would be C. The radius is 0 because you're not going to go away from that 3. The only place it converges is at 3. Okay, not really an interval just a value.
one single value of convergence. Okay, next up. Ah, another way that you might be asked this. They're telling us that this series converges if x is 8 and diverges if x is negative 1. Which of the following must be true? The series diverges at 9, converges at 2, diverges at 0, converges at 3. Let's take a look at this on a number line. I like to take a look at these on a number line. So on a number line, okay, I want, my I want to pull out my center because I know I converge at my center. So when x is 5, when x is 5, I am right in the middle. And I converge, always. Always converge at my center. They're telling me that I also converge at 8. So I'm going to go to 8. 6, 7, 8. And they're telling me I also converge there. Well, if I converge there and my center is 5, I have to converge until I get to 8. I might converge after 8, but I have to converge up until I get 8. And because this is my center, I also have to converge equidistantly on the other side, except possibly right at the endpoint, because 8 might be my endpoint, and if it is, then I may or may not converge at this endpoint over here. So I'm going to go 3 over in the other direction. I'm going to circle this and put a little question mark because we do not know if that converges or diverges. Maybe, but maybe not. That is 4, 3, 2. That is 2. We don't know if we converge or diverge at 2. But I know that I have to converge in here. I must converge here. Now let's go get this diverging. We diverge at negative 1. I'm going to go to negative 1. 1, 0, negative 1. I know I diverge at negative 1. So I'm going to put an open circle. We don't include that one. So I know I diverge there, which is 3 units from my 2. So if I go 3 units from my 8, 10, 11, if I go 3 units from my 8, that's on the other side. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I know something else is happening. I know that on this side, I'm going to, I must diverge. Because if we found a spot where we diverge, there's no way anything on the other side can diverge. And if my center is here, there's, I'm sorry, there's no way anything over here could converge. It has to diverge. And since my center is 5, over here, same thing. We must diverge. Okay. That leaves a lot of unknowns. That leaves here and here. I just don't know. Unknown. So there's my whole number line filled up with things I know and things I don't know. Does the series diverge at 9? At 9, we are unknown. Can't say that for sure. Does the series converge at 2? No, that was our unknown. We don't know that one either. Does the series diverge at 0? At 0, does it diverge? We don't know. It has to be D. Hopefully it's D. When X is 3, when X is 3, do we convert? Do we converge? Yes, we do. So the answer here is D. Let's do another one of those. This time our center is negative 2. I'm going to draw my number line, put my center at negative 2, and I know I converge there, have to converge there. We also converge at positive 2. So let's go to positive 2. Negative 1, 0, 1, 2. I know I converge there. This is 1, 2, 3, 4 units from my center, so if I go 4 units in the other direction, I don't know what I'm doing there for sure, but I know in between here I must converge. 
Okay. What number is this? Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, I'm sorry, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. Okay, that's my unknown. Don't know that. But I do know that I'm diverging at negative 8. So negative 8, <coughs> I know I am diverging. Which means after that, I must diverge. That's an awful little brace. Okay, I must diverge there. So two units from this one, I also, I don't know what I'm doing exactly there, but I know after there, we diverge. We must diverge. That leaves me with some unknowns. Okay, so let's see which is true. Converge at negative 6? Nope, that was our unknown. Converge at 3? That was also our unknown. Diverge at 6? Yes, it has to diverge at 6. Okay, number 8. Converges conditionally. Converges conditionally. The only way we could converge conditionally, let me go back to one of these guys. Back, this was our very first example, back on page one of intervals of convergence. Back here, you guys, converge, we found when x was seven, we found that we were the converging alternating harmonic series. That is also, interestingly, that is a conditional convergence, right? The, only, the interval of convergence, if it converges conditionally, it would only converge conditionally at one of the endpoints. That's the only place it could be conditionally convergent. Okay? So for this question, when they, when they tell me that it converges conditionally at x equals negative 1, they are giving me an endpoint of the interval of convergence. So on my number line here, we're centered at 4, and we converge conditionally at negative 1. 3, 2, 1, 0, negative 1. We converge conditionally at negative 1, that must be my endpoint of the interval of convergence. So I know that after that, I diverge. So I'm converging at my center, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units away. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units away. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I don't know what I'm doing right there but I know what I'm doing until I get there and I know what I'm doing after there. So the only place that I don't know is right at 9 here. So which of the following must be false? Must be false. Diverge at 9. I don't know. Converge at 9. I don't know. It doesn't have to be false. Converges at 7. That's true. Diverges at 7. That's false. That must be false. OK. So that is intervals of convergence. Very big points on the AP exam.